<laughs> Welcome, everyone. Um, I think we're all here. I hope so. Um, good evening. I am Elizabeth Cronin, the Robert B. Menchel Curator of Photography here at the New York Public Library. Whether you're in the room or watching online, we're really pleased and very happy that you're joining us tonight. Tonight's event is our annual conversation on photography generously underwritten by Manaz Isfahani Bartos and Adam Bartos. I'd like to thank both Manaz and Adam for their support of such vital public discussions about photography and for all the incredible support they've given and continue to give the New York Public Library. Tonight, I have the distinct honor of introducing legendary photographer Joel Myrowitz. We're here to discuss his new book, as you can see here <laughs> on the table, um, The Pleasure of Seeing. In it, Myrowitz goes, beyond, uh, goes behind the scenes of his life, above and beyond, of course, um, the, of um, his career. And he's talking with Lorenzo Bracca, a uh, historian and photographer as well. We are pleased that Lorenzo is also here tonight to join us in this conversation. The book, as you, can, as you may have noticed outside, is available in the library shop for purchase and is online as well. If you have a New York Public Library card, you're also welcome to come to the Art and Architecture Division of the Wallet, uh, Ar Ar sorry, Art and Architecture Collection of the Wallach Division um, right upstairs in room th um, 313 and look at it anytime or you can check it out from one of the branch libraries. As a photography curator, I also have to say that we're very happy that we have 33 of Joel's photographs in our collection and you're also welcome to come and view those. We are one of the most publicly accessible collections in the country and all you need is a library card and an appointment. You're welcome to come back anytime. We would love to have you. We'd love to pull out his photographs and show them to you. Again, um, speaking of library services, I have to say that you may have heard we have upcoming New York City budget cuts, which include a proposed $36.2 million cut for the city's libraries. These cuts will force us to curtail hours and, serve and days we are open, also services like this, public programs, at a time when libraries across the country are under threat and open access to information is also under threat, we need to make sure that we're investing in libraries in New York and beyond. We have launched an advocacy campaign to try and stop these cuts. Please visit nypl.org and follow the links to our campaign page. From there, you will be able to easily send a letter to our city hall elected officials to restore funding for libraries. Okay, we will be glad, I'm gonna keep this very short, we will be glad to take some of your questions uh, at the end of the program. And if you're here with us in the room, you all have a little card, you can write down your questions and we will be by periodically to pick them up. And if you are listening and watching online, you can put your message in your question in the chat or email publicprograms at nypl.org. Wherever you are, we would love to hear from you. Thank you very much for joining us. And now let's please welcome Lorenzo Bracca and Joel Meyerowitz. Legendary photographer. That's, uh, that's quite something to live up to, huh? How do you feel when somebody calls you like that? Uh, legend? Icon? Yeah. Do you like it, you know, to be called a I legend? You know what I say? I say, who, me? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. It sort of puts you in a, in a category in a way. But um, I think you have to live up to it and yeah. actually make the work and continue to make the work and be challenged by photography. It's a great, expansive medium that invites all kinds of mentalities, personalities, intelligences, aptitudes, psycho, whatever. <laughs> and um, I try to play along that whole line. <laughs> well, Joel's story is one that hasn't stopped, really, for 60 years. And I think that tonight, I mean, we'll do the best to, uh, you know, to synthesize, to compress 60 years in just 60 minutes. It's not, it's a, it's a big deal. So we're going to A minute a year. 
we're going to cover. <laughs> so 1962, when you started, what did you do? <laughs> you have a minute. <laughs> uh, but wait a second. I, I have to introduce Lorenzo to you again, because all during the pandemic, for two years of that time, Lorenzo and I spoke to each other and saw each other in Italy. We, Maggie and I were living in Italy during that time. And these conversations, for fun, developed into this book, a, a, a biography of, of my life and work. And I really have to thank Lorenzo for his curiosity and his skill and his reach. He's both a serious Renaissance historian and a photographer. And so he brought to the conversation a whole different way of thinking about imagery and meaning. And uh, I'm really grateful, Lorenzo. Well, I'm the one who say, tip, should say thank you hand. for giving me this <laughs> chance, this opportunity. I mean, for an historian, it's not, uh, especially someone like me who studied the Middle Ages, uh, mainly, uh, <laughs> <laughs> You don't get often the opportunity to talk to one of the sources, if you don't mind me uh, to call <laughs> you so. <laughs> All your sources being long dead. <laughs> <laughs> but pretty much. So it was a sort of a historian wet dream to, to talk to somebody like you. <laughs> 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 no, 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 seriously, seriously, I mean it, I mean it. Uh, I was thinking as an historian, I was thinking of historians of the future. Would, you know, at some point people will, already now, but in the future even more, I hope, uh, people will turn back and look at the history of photography and what happened in New York, especially in the 60s and 70s and, and so on. And you need sources, especially from, you know, people that were there. So this is not just a biography. This is not just a visual biography, because, of course, we wanted to give the right space to pictures. Uh, but also, it is Joel's point of view on the history of the medium in a particular time, in a particular space. So especially in New York, I was... Um, so interested in knowing what you thought about people that we're going to talk about tonight, like John Tchaikovsky and Gary Winogrand and all that, because you were there and you lived it and you're still here to bring the witness of Thank what it meant. I'm still here. Yeah. <laughs> Please, <laughs> I can talk about it. Yes, okay. So, yeah, so we started, actually, let's, let's get going with this. Now, I don't see the slides. Oh, here we go. So, we said you started in 1962 and you started taking pictures, or making pictures, I should say, of parades because you felt shy, you didn't feel like pointing your camera in front of... Yeah. Well, you know, I was, I was 24 years old, and, uh, and I was new to photography, and I, I had to learn my chops on the street, in a way. And, and being shy, it was difficult to overcome, you know, when do you take a picture, how close can you get to somebody, what's the timing like, um, should I pretend I'm doing something and then do something else? It, strategies, in a way, have to evolve to fit your personality. And fortunately, I had met another young photographer, maybe you know, Tony Ray Jones. That a name any of you know? Great English photographer? We'll get to him in a second. We have a slide yeah. with a picture mm. of him. Well, both of us were art directors before we became photographers. And somehow we found each other in a lab looking at our slides, our first slides, and we started hanging out together, and we used the parades on the weekends in the spring in New York as camouflage because there was so much action on the side streets watching the parade go by. But it was not the parade so much that was interesting, but it was the characters on the side streets that were, allowed us to be invisible. Because I think one of the first things you have to learn when you're a street photographer is how do you disappear while being aggressive and assertive and trying to get close to people. So finding that out and, and learning how to um, not be defeated by being in the public was an important part of our education. And, and the parades mm. gave us that cover. Mm -hmm. So the next, que next question would be, how do you disappear and make a picture like this one? You're right yeah. in their face. I mean, this is probably it does seem like a contradiction, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, learning how to frame whatever it is you see usually is a step back. But after a while, the, the hunger to see we, you know, made me want to get closer and closer to sort of test how close can you get to people without offending them or having them shove your camera in your face. But, but how can you play on the street? and still make photographs. And, and so, you know, this was one of those parades where 
um, I just kept on getting closer and closer, and I saw these guys with their hats and their, and their whispering conversation or whatever they were talking about, and I just moved in. And you know, nobody went like this. There was no, I think in, in the 60s, there was a kind of street innocence. No one could imagine that they were having their picture taken by some young guy. It's like, who, me? They, if I came up close to somebody, they would look behind to see if I was photographing someone else over there. So that innocence, long gone now, uh, that was cover for us. And, and um, if you learn how to use that and, and have your own approach, which is a kind of open-hearted, generous, smiley face, you can get away with murder. <laughs> Not like Trump would get away with murder on Fifth Avenue, but your own kind of murder. Well, you developed your tricks, I guess. <laughs> I want you to include this picture in the slides because there's an ambiguity about this, which, I, which attracts me, draws me to whatever is happening there. I don't know if you can kind of understand or decipher, uh, but it's good if you don't, because that's what photography is about, I guess, not giving answers, but you know, making you ask the right questions. This is one yeah. of those things. Well, it describes something, again. right? Yeah. The photographer always describes what's in front of the, the camera and the photographer's ap you know, appetite. But sometimes what it shows isn't what it's really about. You know, it's a deception in a way. I mean, Lorenzo was always curious about this picture. And, and what is it? Is it the guy with his hat on his heart for he's um, recognizing that the black man with the dog, you know, might, might have um, some kind of equation with him? Is he, is he thinking like that? No. It might look like that. But in fact, the parade behind me is walking by, and the flags are flying, and this guy, probably an old veteran, takes off his hat and puts it over his heart because it was tradition when the flag went by that you put your hand to your heart or your hat over your heart. So I saw the gesture, and I knew that it related to what was behind me, but I saw how it fit in with the context of what was there. Mm -hmm. So it's that kind of... A, playful spirit where you just try it. You, know, yeah. you have to keep trying. Yeah. It also tells me about the, um, how sometimes photographs um, are sustained by the balance between lightness and heaviness. And in this picture you see these two figures are two opposites. You know, the guy with the hat with this solemn gesture is all about heaviness. And the other guy we tend to sympathize for is all light. He's, you know, he's casually dressed and he has a smirk and he's, he's He's not He's serious, smiling. He's smiling. I think it's more of a smirk than a smile. Though. Smir it's a grin. Smir yeah. It's something Very is good. Very good. The guy who's fluent in Italian only and English says smirk. I couldn't say smirk in Italian. I just looked up the vocabulary the, the this morning. <laughs> <laughs> there's a few key words, difficult words that I can say to impress the audience. I, <clears throat> I just studied them just for that particular purpose. I can say bewildering or, you know, Fad befuddling. I don't know what they mean, but I know they, they sound pompous <laughs> enough. And my fake British accent, of course, is just to make me sound more intelligent. As soon as I start moving my hand, you'll go, ha-ha, here's the Italian. Anyway. So this is Tony Ray Jones. If you don't know him, he's a British photographer who was here in New York for a few years. And you and him studied together, you can say. Actually, you two studied together with Alexei Brodovich. Am I wrong? Well, we started together before, and then later in the year, we heard that Alexei Bradovich, who was the, the great art director of Harper's Bazaar, was giving a course in Richard Avedon's studio. And apparently, he had taught a lot of photographers. Robert Frank studied with Alexei Bradovich, who then hired him to shoot some pictures for Bazaar. Uh, and so Tony and I, both being graphic designers like Bradovich, we said, OK, we're going to go too. And it was, it was interesting. It was, it was, I would say it was challenging because Brodovich was really leaning towards the commercial, mm. towards magazine photography. So you had to take away from what he was talking about only the things that really pertain to you. And right. he had these gems periodically, stories and things like that. And then he became seriously ill and was hospitalized, and Dick Avedon took over the class for a couple of months. And that was interesting and strange and, and totally directed towards fashion. And you know, I, I, neither Tony or I or a number of other photographers were interested 
in making a living doing fashion, we were, we were involved in the mystery of photography. The mystery is expressed by Robert Frank and Cartier-Bresson. So, you know, it, it was off the mark, but it was also engaging and mm. challenging. Mm. Mm. I, had a, I had a fight with Avedon. About uh, what? I, I, you know, a little pisher like me at 24, <laughs> and I'm arguing with someone who was already a master, you know. Oh, I don't want it. So it's... Well... Did you want to talk about it? it? It's it's a should we it's skip the subject? It's a story. You want to hear a story? Yeah. Well, of course. We've got to keep our eye about, on, the, on the clock. I should have about fighting. Dick Avedon said, so the next assignment is all of you have to go to um, a photomat booth and make a strip of photographs that have never been seen before. So what are you going to do? Right? I knew uh, a woman living around the corner from where I lived on West End Avenue. And uh, I knew she had posed in the nude for art classes. So I went to her and I said, would you come with me to a photomat booth and get undressed in the photomat booth? And we're going <laughs> to, we're going to, on 96, on the, on the, on the Broadway line, 96th Street and, and Broadway, <laughs> there was a photomat booth in the subway, <laughs> in between up the, the, the local and the express. <laughs> So I, I put her in there, and I decorated it with pillows and everything. I sort of made a harem out of it, and I brought in some little costume things. At this point, I should, uh, um, you know, if there's any you underage for listening. This, and they said yes. So I made these, I would put my quarter in, and then I would stick my head in and direct her. And I made four strips. And then I took these strips to the building where the ad agency I'd worked in was. And in the basement was a, a, a lab that made... Um, big enlargements for advertising agencies. And I had them blow each strip up to four feet. And I mounted them, and I brought them into the class. And everybody else brought in just a little strip, <laughs> and it was people making funny faces at the camera or putting things in front. Like, and I had these four-foot nudes in there, <laughs> you know. And, and, uh, and when Avedon came to mine, and he said, I don't know, you know, couldn't you find a really beautiful model? <laughs> and I said, I'm not Dick Avedon. I can't get models come to the, to the studio. I had a friend come, but you asked for something that was challenging, and I thought that maybe this, four feet tall, was challenging enough, and to actually do a, a, a nude in the subway <laughs> seemed to me to be challenging. <laughs> anyway, we duked it out over that, but became friends years later. <laughs> what a great story. <laughs> I'm sorry it's not in the book, but there you go, you got something. I could show you. Yeah, we can, have, we can do a special edition. Now, let's say something about Gary Winogan. Gary was one of your associates, or actually one of your closest friends. He's my buddy, yeah. We, I mean, we both were from the Bronx. Uh, we bumped into each other on a train coming back. We both were visiting our mothers in the Bronx one day, and, and we're sitting in, this, in, the, in, the, in the subway car, and we're across from each other, just by chance. And he said, I, I see you on Fifth Avenue. I said, I see you all the time on Fifth Avenue. And, and we got to talking, and he invited me to his apartment and showed me hundreds and hundreds of photographs. They were stacked like this high off the floor, all the way down the hallway, in the bedroom, in the living room, in the dining room. Oh. He just, prints were everywhere. And I was shooting color. And now I had, for the first time, I had a chance to look at black and white photographs hold them in my lap, and sort of flip through them. Because when you show slides on the screen, mm. they're transitory. Mm. You know, no one ever gets up to walk close and look at the, picture, at the details in the picture. But when you have a print, you can see that. And I, I suddenly had this sense that I would have to add black and white to my vocabulary at some point. Because I started in color. The first rolls of film I bought were color. I worked for the first year in color. and. Uh, although I loved it, there was that little bit of frustration when you were with people without a projector. You want to hand them mm -hmm. something to look at so mm -hmm. that you can have a conversation. Mm -hmm. So I, Gary and I were able to do that. And, and uh, we met usually every morning at a greasy spoon on 96th Street in Columbus. And we'd have breakfast. And then we'd walk down through the park and the zoo. where He was doing a book on the zoo at that point. And then we'd walk up and down Fifth Avenue all day. <laughs> Waiting for stuff to happen. Uh, 
we talk about the material value of the pictures in the book, uh, but one thing I didn't ask you is what did he think of your color pictures? Did he understood the value of, even if it's not, it wasn't printed because you couldn't afford Oh, well, we it. showed slides to each other. Gary shot a lot of color, you know, yeah, mostly commercially, but he yeah. also shot It's not well known, color. but he did. No, yeah. there was a show a year ago at, Brooklyn, at the Brooklyn Museum, right? There was a lot mm. of Gary's, early, yeah. really early color from the late 50s into the early 60s. But he wasn't so interested in it because it required printing, and printing was expensive, and you couldn't do it in your dark room. Mm. It's not like today. You can send a file from your computer into your printer, and you got a print. Mm. So um, he didn't follow it through mm. further, you know, and, and I did, but I also did it by, you know, shifting between black and white in color. Uh -huh. Well, we get to that point, but first I want to close this little section on, on Friends talking about John Sharkovsky. Now, if you don't know him, he was the head of the photography department of the Museum of Modern Art here in New York for about 20 years, wasn't it? 62, than, no, no, 30 20, years. Like, more like 30 some odd years. Yeah, 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 62, 92, <coughs> I think are the dates. And um, he gave you the, uh, not just the first show, but that came later on in, um, but he gave you the first, he put your first picture in an exhibition was this one, and it was close to one of Robert Frank's. Yes, it was a photographer's yeah. eye. It was John's first big philosophical show in 1963, Three, I think. Three or four. And uh, I was really incredibly honored to be, uh, to have a picture like this, because it's sort of a, a difficult picture in the sense that it's all, you know, grilled in a way, covered up and scratched out and covered over. And, and uh, and he he got it, you know. He understood. He of course he understood it. But what was so thrilling for me is that he hung it next to a picture of Robert Franks. There's a picture of a guy playing a tuba, and the tuba covers his face, and there's an American flag behind him. And uh, it was Robert Frank who was my first uh, interaction with seeing f a photographer work, and it so thrilled me and opened my mind instantly that I quit my job and went out and started to make photographs. So it, the fact that a year later I would actually be in a show <laughs> hanging on a wall next to him was like, you know, impossible to believe. I think he understood your instinct and he valued them. He gave you the space that uh, he thought you deserved to progress from that and, and carry on with your work. You yeah, well, you know, he Shark wasn't doing it just with you. He was doing it with no, a lot no, of other young Sharkovsky photographers. For everybody, Sharkovsky was, I, I, I think that we all have a debt to what he put in motion because his understanding of photography and the way he read images was so profound and, and filled with questions and a huge appetite that suddenly photography started to have a kind of grasp you know, on, on the minds and intelligences of the art world. Before then, it was a, sort of a craft over there in the basement where they keep the developer down there. It, you know, it wasn't a serious photography department. Mm -hmm. But when he took over, he was able to buy works and make shows. He made, you know, eight shows a year or something like that. Big ones, little ones. And he was welcoming photographers in every single week on Wednesday. You could bring your portfolios in and leave them with John. And he would look at every portfolio. If there were 10 or 40, it didn't matter. He would look at them all, kept notes on them all. And that kind of uh, appetite influenced all of us because we saw that there was someone there who wanted to talk to us, to question us. And you know, Tony, and. Gary and me, we, we didn't have anything to say about a photograph. It was like, well, I, I like that. that. That's tough. That's interesting. They were like one word critiques, you know. Yeah. And they were always sort of in the approval. Uh -huh. But John could talk about looking at photographs and the way into them and the levels and layers and resonances and meanings and ex expansion of it so that after a while, one could engage with him. I could engage with him. I, and, I, and I didn't feel so tongue-tied and embarrassed, you know. But it took a while. And that picture, go back one there. The, this is John in his, 
in his office. He's looking at a bunch of my prints. And behind him on the wall is a show he's laying out in scale so that he sees the sizes. And if you look above that, there's a map. Can you see funny little angles and things like that? That's all the dividing walls in the exhibition so that you would go in and go around and come out this side and walk to this wall. And he was taking you on a journey for your eye and your mind. Mm. And that's how he planned every show. It wasn't mm. just putting pictures up on a wall, like in a mm. gallery, to mm. sell them. It was to expand the understanding that pictures contained within them when you saw them relating to each other. And this is, this is part of the art form. Single images that you make one at a time, but then you put them together and something happens, some kind of flicker of recognition or vibration or connection. It's a language, you know, using signs that we, you know, grasp from the street. So he was, he was brilliant in that way. And I think every one of us who were graced by this opportunity uh, grew from it. And, and, and really, I don't think I could say any of what I'm saying about mm. my feelings about photography without having had those incredible moments trying to express myself to John in language. He didn't do it just with you photographers working around him, but we did. it's important to mention that, uh, you mentioned it before, the, the Photographer's Eye was an exhibition, but then it became a book. And with this book, uh, John was establishing a grammar, if you wish, for photography or yeah. a language. I mean, he was teaching very much so um, how to speak about photography, how to write about photography. So he speaks about uh, categories or categories or coordinates like the uh, the thing itself or the, uh, mm -hmm. the vantage point <coughs> or, things or the frame or the frame yeah <coughs> and all of this was really important at that time i think it's still relevant today it's the book still is still in print if you haven't read it especially if you're a young photographer yeah. and you're starting this is absolutely i, I invite you to do you know this, this book? book the photographer's eye some of you yeah. it's still available at moma or elsewhere it's really, it's an important book. If you're a serious photographer and you don't know the book, mm. you should get it. And then there's mirrors and windows and there's looking at photographs. There's a bunch of books that he did over the, all over the years that are really, really precious yes. for anybody interested in, uh, in a scholarly, but not just scholarly way to photography. Let's, let's go on, we've got to go on. Time is flying by. They only have two hours for us. We've extended my life I by two minutes for each year. <laughs> <laughs> So one of the things I like about uh, this picture and the thing it shows pretty clearly is how you're interested in frames, how frames capture your eyes, not just yours. I mean, it's, it's a common thing. It's a common trope between photographers. Uh, just this morning, I saw this show, uh, this Lee Friedlander's show. It, you know, it's called Frame. It's all about frames. Spectacular it's fantastic. show. And, uh, and in this picture here, if you start counting the frames, you know, you've got the arch, then you've got the little theater, that's the shadow inside the little theater, it's another frame, and then there's the, the mirror above it, and then you have, of course, the silver screen, and then you've got the image inside the silver screen, which is slightly misplaced. If you start counting, it's like nine of them, seven or nine of them, I don't know exactly. <laughs> and in the next picture, again, again, frame inside the frame, keep this in mind, because you'll see this thing recurring again and again in Joel's pictures. Uh, but since time is short, let's, let's no, that, again, a woman in frame. But also here, one of the things I like is the most evident reference here is to Magritte. And when I see these pictures, uh, I always think about what Susan Sontag said about photography, that photography is the only art that is natively surreal, uh, which doesn't mean that photographs need to look surreal. This one does, but this is not <laughs> the point. The point <laughs> is that it's the only art that has a sort of special relationship with automatism, and with uh, the incident, you know, this is an art that invites the accent like a blessing rather than something that gets in the middle and doesn't help you achieving what you want. And uh, with doubling the world, with the concept of the ready-made. <clears throat> so, and you're somebody that worked a lot with surrealism. You, you provoked uh, things like this, for mm. example, which looks like a simple image, but then you start noticing that the shadows of the, uh, of the slides form a sort of you know, it looks like a violin yeah. a little bit, a violin holds, and this yeah. picture now starts to look a bit like Dali, a Dali painting. Yes, well, it, it has a kind of Dali-esque perspective to it, mm. without the lines going down to infinity. 
but it, but the space of it and the the uh, the edginess of the light it does i always felt the same way about it yeah. the the gestures of the, the the kids there the the poise and the the frozen moment of it like that. but wait before we go on you were saying something about frames and i was thinking yeah. how so often when i was teaching i would notice that a lot of my students, I was teaching color at Cooper Union in the 70s, a lot of the students would put frames in pictures, mm -hmm. you know, box things in, in a little bit. And it's almost as if, and I, I think this was true for me too, you, you got this instrument in your hand that has a 35 millimeter frame. So you have to fill that frame with interesting things. And sometimes the frame suggested a frame that you mm -hmm. would see in there. So you would, it would sort of mimic the world in a way, a picture in a picture. Mm -hmm. And those are impulsive reaches, you know. You, you say, oh, it's a and you just do it. It's almost like without thinking. But your instinct proposes that that frame within a frame is going to have some kind of elasticity or magnetism or something will be jarring in there. And maybe that thing in the frame will have a play in the picture. Yeah. So I, I think it's an early stage of photographer's development yeah. to recognize the frame itself. Yeah. And, and John has that chapter on the frame, right, right. what's in and what's out. Uh, and, and so I, I think it's part of every photographer's consciousness. When you're making a picture and you're moving through a street, you are visualizing the street already. But before the camera comes to your eye, you're seeing the things that are cohering. Maybe, and what's interesting about that is that they're incoherent. They don't relate to each other, but you putting the frame in your mind's eye around them are joining together dissimilar things and you're making the content. Mm -hmm. By putting the frame around it, you engage all that energy. And if you see quirky things that speak just to you, you begin to realize your identity because you pack things in the frame a certain way. And if you analyze your own photographs with an open heart and an open mind, you'll begin to see yourself popping up in these pictures. Your, your, the things that keep on coming back to you, the timing, the relationships, the color, quality of light, they begin to be markers for each of your own personalities, your photographic personalities. So the frame is where you start. The frame compresses what you have in front of your eyes. I was about to say reality, but who knows what reality is. Yeah. Let's say what's in front of your eyes. It's and dramatizes it. It gives it a meaning. That, now, dramatize this. Uh, what, what's going on in this It's another frame. frame. Uh, yeah, to, uh, the first time you, I looked at this thing, I thought, oh, there's a mirror. But then you realize that actually, no. Somebody you know, took the... Uh, the, the how do you say it? A two-headed cow? Yeah, what, what, somebody went there and sold. So, so, I can't never so. pronounce that. So the two heads together. What, what's the point? Well, Why I, is there a Chinese typewriter? What's the point? Of, what's I think it was here? a Siamese cow. <laughs> and a Chinese typewriter. So you could see my interest immediately. You know, I always thought this would Can be I? a cover for a book, the Chinese typewriter, which we didn't. I mean, those of us who are not Chinese don't know what it means, but I thought that, because a lot of the things I photograph, I don't know what they mean either, and I thought that that title would work. But to see the combination together, and my know. advice to you, Brian, is never pass a two-headed cow. <laughs> <laughs> or a fallen man in the street. Never pass a fallen man in the street without making a picture. <laughs> you know, that's right. Well. What can you say about this picture? It's, it's, uh, it's one of those gifts, right? I, I'm, I'm sorry that the guy had whatever happened to him. I don't know, I was just a bystander walking in the direction. I saw a crowd, I immediately went to see what the crowd was about. And as I arrived there, I see this fallen man and a guy with a hammer stepping over him. I, I, in an instinct, you know, I made the picture, one picture only. And uh, I mean, my my, my guess was the guy didn't knock him down. But the fact that he was stepping over him while carrying a, a hammer, I almost said camera, a uh, hammer, uh, and nobody helping this guy. I mean, in New York, 
I have knelt on the street with people who have fallen out of buses or slipped on the sidewalk, and I've knelt down to help them. And you know, but in Paris, nobody, nobody cared. Not again. And to me, that was the tragedy. Not not so much the fallen man, but the tragedy that nobody would come to his aid. Mm -hmm. But it's about the ambiguity again, because you, of course, you never know. You'll never know. It's just an accident, or the two are fighting. Who knows? Ambiguity, but playfulness as well. I mean, you mentioned Robert Frank being one of your idols, one of your heroes. But when I look at your pictures, I don't see, I know how much he meant for you and how much you looked at the Americans, the book, the famous book. Uh, but then in your photograph, you never find the harshness or the melancholy of, of Robert's work. You, there was almost no playfulness, no, light, like no lightness of touch. But in this case, you can clearly see how Meyerowitz was a million miles away from, from Frank, from his hero. Yeah. I'm a joyful person. I mean, you know, I'm very optimistic and positive about things, and I, I'm, I'm thrilled by joyous moments, you know, spontaneous, unexpected, gust of wind, hat blowing, I mean, whatever it is, it's like nature is providing, you know, the moment in some, yeah. in some way, human beings and nature itself and all of that, and I, I you know, I'm ready, right? Mm -hmm. I always carry my camera, used to say cocked and ready, but now I have to turn it on or turn it off or wake it up. No, I have to wake it up all <laughs> yeah. day long, waking it up. <laughs> Let's make an appeal to camera manufacturers. Let's go back to one. Anyway, um, you know, the unexpected is part of the gift of photography, that in a fraction of a second, you can write this whole little story of a fraction of a second. I think this is time is that malleable that you can be in it, with it, flowing with it, responding to it, open to it. To me, that's uh, it's you know I found the, the medium that is right for me in that regard. I recently heard Sting, Sting the musician, uh, say in a uh, <laughs> in, in an interview that when he's listening to a song, if he's not surprised within the first eight bars he'll lose the interest, he'll stop listening. Mm -hmm. And I think this is really relevant for photography as well, surprise being one of the most important aspects to capture your eyes, especially nowadays in, you know, when we're looking at pictures on Instagram and this mall, in order to capture our attention, you know, and to have something, a catch, something in the center. And that has changed photography massively because the photographs you made in the 60s or 70s are more difficult to read uh, on this, in this dimension, you know, yeah. you, you want them large, but maybe we'll get to that later on. I would like to talk sure. about uh, how the me medium evolved. Um, but speaking about lightness of touch, I mean, look at this. You have, um, this is Malaga in 1967, if I remember well. Yes, in uh, Semana Santa. The Semana Santa, they're preparing Easter. the procession. And you have these um, two men on the left preparing the, uh, the sculpture, let's say, for, for the procession. And there's a boy, a faceless boy, who's already kind of, already part of that dimension, where on the other side of the, of the picture, you can see the two girls playing with their dolls. And what, yeah. what, the first thing you thought when you saw these two girls well, coming? You know, first of all, to see the, the, you know, the iconography of the church mm. outside, because they're gonna carry this around town, 100 men will be carrying a litter, all dressed in robes, and on the litter will be, you know, a crucifix or a crucifixion or a deposition or some iconography, and uh, they'll parade it through the town, surrounded by candles at night, and there'll be young boys who are just whose voices are changing, singing from the balconies. They call them flechas, arrows. Their voices are like piercing arrows as the, as the iconography passes by. And so they were all out on the streets, and I was walking down the street, and I see them, you know, dusting it off. And, and I love the gesture of the one guy who's just cleaning her, her eyebrow in that way or pushing it back. And I see up the street two girls carrying their dolls, and so... For me, it was like you know the big doll and the little dolls, boys and girls. And I mean, it was like a joke, but also a scale change and how the effigy is important in mm -hmm. life, mm -hmm. whether it's religious or playing mama. Mm -hmm. you know? So 
in, in a split second, one has to try to assimilate the, the data that's flowing at you and the gestures and the meanings and all of that. And that's the game. The game of sight is to see how much you, as a photographer, can read into whatever is coming your way. What do you see? What, what does it make you feel? You know, do you have any instinct or intuition? Do you feel the bump? You know, like a little pulse in your chest, like, you know, awake, suddenly awake. And I, I think probably what I learned over all these years is that that fraction of a second of consciousness is what it's all about. To be in the moment, realizing that something that is uncontrolled and meaningless in the stew that's out there for you, for me, at that moment, it seems to gel into some kind of fleeting meaning. Mm. And only the camera, at a thousandth of a second, can hold on to that. And I think we're capable, as human beings, of feeling these sensations and understandings in a thousandth of a second. Our system, our mental qualities, have that capacity. And so it's a perfect match, you know, the camera and sensibility. Yeah, if you think that way. Yeah, that's what I mean when I say surrealism. I mean, it's, it's, mm -hmm. it's the, the ability to be connected with your subconscious and, and mm -hmm. you know, take it out in this way. So I think, I think Sontag was right. And especially about uh, with street photography, you've got this particular skill. This is still Malaga. Um, and I wanted to show this picture because uh, it's reminiscent of the painter, which was a great <laughs> inspiration for you when you were studying arts in the... It's true, when I was studying art, yeah. Which is Rubens, and the next slide we show you, these are two paintings by Rubens, and you can see in the halls, you know, the torsion of the head and the way they're falling. Of course, I'm not implying that Joel was, you know, consciously trying to reproduce a Rubens, but no. it was in his, in his head, in his imaginary. Yeah, I, I, th I think that studying art history and, and paint, being a painter at those in, in my university days, the, the, the energy in Rubens' paintings, the tumultuous energy, the, everything writhing, the, the Baroque, really, you know, and all of that was so thrilling to see. It was so muscular, and the paintings were gigantic. You know, they filled this room like that in, in, in the scale of them. And I think what I, when I started to work on the street, I, I saw a similar kind of tumult, except it was contemporary, you know? We didn't have horses and tigers and stuff like that, but we had clothing and movement and buses and signage and flags and all, so everything seemed to be just rhythmic. Mm -hmm. And I think that the, the rhythm, the beat of the street in New York, the jazz of the street was probably what filled my head, you know? And, and so I was, when a picture like that fallen horse, when a moment like that came, how could I not stop and watch how it worked? But I have to say something here. Okay. This is with Kodachrome film, hmm. ASA 25, slow, but rendering fantastically. And that film could capture the darkness of the fallen horse in the shadow while holding on to all of the information in the highlights. That film was so elastic, it was so profound, that if you learn to work with it and make the right exposures, you, you, could, you could get everything. Mm. And so all this content was really exciting to me. I remember seeing a print of this, and actually, when you see it on the screen, you don't get quite the, the impressive latency that that Colochrome used to have. Shame that we don't we don't use it anymore. We we can't use it anymore. Uh, now look at the tiger. Look at the tiger on the right, and look at this now. <laughs> you see, it's still working in his brain. Uh, <coughs> But you didn't look at the tiger when you made this picture. No, no, I was interested in the booties on the, on the dog. <laughs> <laughs> Little booties there. And the way all the shoes of the women lined up as from the curb where the shadow is 
Yeah. Actually, I was interested in everything in the picture because this was a period in my life where I, you know, I had been using color and then I used black and white and color. And at a certain point, I was done with black and white. And I, when I knew that I was committing to color only, I found that I had to change my strategy on the street. If I wanted the description, color's description of everything in the frame, from seven feet in front of me to infinity, then I had to change my way of behaving on the street. And this came, this, this idea came from John Tcharkovsky, because Tcharkovsky would say, look, all a, all a photograph is, is what the photographer sees in front of the camera, and it just is a description of that. And my understanding was, well, if it's description, then anything that's out of focus isn't describing what's there. And anything that's in black and white isn't giving me the full description of what's there. And so in order to get that, I changed my tactic and I moved back to about 15 feet out so that I would photograph the field in front of me, which meant everything. It meant the glitter in the concrete on the sidewalks. It meant the, you know, the flags flapping on the buildings, the shine on the steel or the glass or the marble on the buildings. Everything seemed to me to have potency. I wanted it to mean something without the incident in the frame. Because most of my pictures and my generation's pictures used an incident, some little hook to catch your eye to make you look at the picture. Interaction, lovers, handshakes, fights, embraces. I mean, all the stuff that's the language of, of people on the street. And so I, I was trying to see if I could penetrate that and make everything in the frame be of some interest. So I'm not kidding when I say the booties on the dog and the sign on the guy's back and the women's shoes lined up that way and the man with the briefcase coming out of the shadow and the tiger leaping. All that stuff was content. I know you always say that, and I have to say, I don't really believe you when you said you constantly keep everything under control. How can you possibly see the woman on the left, the face coming on the left of the man, the bag, the horse? Come on, I've done it. It's not possible. I don't believe you. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, okay, fair enough. You've done it for longer than I have. But Just go to the, the pictures. You'll see it happen again and no, again. We'll and see again. it with camel coats. Uh, no, there's but you a picture. Know, it's, it's really... I mean, it's important. It's training. It's like sports. You know, if you, you play baseball, whatever position you play, you've got to be aware of everything else that's happening on the field. I played baseball in, in high school and in college. And I, I could watch that field. I had, to be, I had to be looking at everything all the time. Here's a question, some questions. <coughs> anyway, okay. I think it is possible, Lorenzo. And I'm watching all over, you know. And... I often anticipate what's going to happen. I, I say, oh, that guy that's carrying something, he's coming, he's coming in. And so if I move over here, he's going to get to that point by the time these people go over here. Mm -hmm. I'm reading the hidden text of mm -hmm. the street mm -hmm. because I see it as text. You know? And I'm scanning that text as fast as I can. And then, I'm not looking through the camera all the time. I'm looking at the street. And then the camera comes up when the moment is right. I was provoking <coughs> you because I wanted to, um, to, to make you say something about the, the, the immersion, almost the meditation you need to be, the kind of meditation state you need to be in the street. Because it's true that every so often the immersion is so profound, so deep, that you can actually keep under control almost everything. You know, it's like cold reading for, card, um, um, for fortune tellers, you know, when somebody uh, reads your future, reads what, what your <coughs> destiny or whatever, or something <coughs> happened to you recently, how they do it. They know it somehow with, this, with their subconscious, it's something telling, and they don't know it consciously. As Orson Welles says something about this. If you look at it online, there's an interview I think he gave to Dick Cavett when he explains that um, he once worked for an afternoon as a fortune teller, and it's, it's an incredible story. I mean, the man was, was, really, was really something. And he explained how, at some point, one woman entered the room where he was doing this thing. And 
he immediately knew that there was a tragedy with this woman. He didn't know why or how, but something in, I don't know, maybe the lipstick or the, what, something she was wearing. She sat down and she said, your husband just died, didn't he? And she burst into tears. It was true. He said, at that point, I stopped. I didn't, I didn't need to do it any further. And I don't think there's any, you know, any, any ghost story behind this thing. There must be something in our brain that goes before our conscious uh, procession. Mm -hmm. And I think street photography works in the kind of same way. You can anticipate something happening if you are immersed enough, if you're done. So I yeah. kind of believe you, then say that. <laughs> when you said you have under thing under control, but it's not an, a conscious... No, I don't have anything under control. Uh, I only have, I only have my, my scan like that. I think we need to ask a few questions now. Because yeah. they're going to have questions. We have questions already, so I'm probably going to start asking questions right now while we <coughs> go through the next No, pictures. I think we should move along. This is important. Um, should we ask the question, or do you want to go on? No, I, uh, no. We, uh, we only have going ten, and then we ten minutes left. Okay, let's keep, let's keep going with the slides. Let's and run we'll through this, the end. so we can take some questions. So, uh, in the 60s, color photography was not taken seriously, because black and white was the dominant characteristic. And as a young photographer of shooting color, I finally could afford a second camera, and I decided that I was going to make the argument for color. So if, if the moment had enough length to it before it changed, I would make a black and white and a color picture. And sometimes I didn't know, because I, I always set the cameras for what it was. It didn't matter which camera, I just made the picture. So I wasn't trying to make a better one. I was just trying to make the pictures and then see afterwards what I learned about the difference between color and black and white. And I'll just point out here, because then we should roll along. You look at that color picture. There's the blimp, right? Look at the bottom of the blimp. It's catching the reflection of the sea surface on the bottom of the blimp, so it's a kind of green underneath there. Now, to me, the green of that and the green of this astroturf was a kind of content. In a black and white picture, you would never know that that green was there. So we lost content. And that was what I was trying to make my argument about, that we sensitive creatures that we are, we live and breathe in color, atmosphere, sunlight, clothing we choose, the colors of our skins, our eyes. We're, we're constantly dealing with that, and that black and white was an abstraction, which we learned to love as an art form. But the color carried this resonance, this wavelength, and, and so I, I made hundreds of pairs of pictures. And some of these will be shown at Tate Modern this November in a, in a show that I'll have there that'll be up for a year or more. So if you find yourself in London, you'll see it. But I mean, look, you know, here are these, these bridesmaids, you know, and in, if you see the black and white picture, you think they're wearing white dresses, right? But when you look at them in the color picture, you get everything. You get the, the, the luscious quality of their lips, the, the, this, their skin tones, the, the color of their dresses. This stuff is it's important. More meaning. Yeah. That's what you're for, saying. For me, basically. more content, more meaning, more reading. <clears throat> so we don't have to talk about any of these. No. We just move along. Well, one of the things that it's, we were kind of anticipating before is removing the central incident from the pictures. And I think this picture in particular shows it really well, what you call field photographs, where the energy <coughs> of the image is spread all across the frame rather than being yeah. in the center. And from 1974, Three, four, three, four, five, like that. I was, I was trying to move away from. Well, this has a pole in the center, but it has everything spread out around it. I was trying to void the center, really seeing the picture and then having to turn away to try to bring in the stuff that didn't count in some way to to rough up the frame, so that I could learn to um, work in a, in a way yeah. that was more harmonious to the ideas that I was having, the mm -hmm. desires to make photographs in a new way for me, to still be on the street, but to not make the photographs that were in the tradition of Cartier-Bresson or Robert Frank, but to break with that. And to do that, 
in any art form, you have to give up. At some point, you have to give up what it is you do best. You have to sort of fail push yourself over the edge so that you take a risk and make pictures that don't work exactly the same, the right way, until they do, until you adjust to your own risk you know, tolerance and start to make pictures that make sense to you. I, I tell you, when I was making these pictures, go to the next one, is there one more, the next one? When, when I was making these pictures, I showed them to Gary and to Todd Papageorge, my two closest friends, you know, and they were like, you're losing your touch, Joel. You know, I, I don't get it. You know, and I would say, yeah, well, it's in color. You know, and I, I'm, I'm doing, I'm actually driving this car. I'm trying to make it swerve in some way. So, and it's important to have conversations with your friends, even if they're antagonistic in some way, because the more you have that antagonism, the more you have to defend it and refine your way of thinking about the issues that you're taking on. Otherwise, complacency sets in and you make the same picture over and over your whole life and, and photography becomes less interesting. And I find this medium so malleable and elastic. It's given me so many new ways of thinking and working over the years. I mean, I've, I've done like eight, nine different bodies of work over the years, and I, it keeps on refreshing me. And here I am, 85 years old, and I like photography still. It's exciting to me. I think it's really appropriate for a street photographer <clears throat> to define photography as the art of letting go of, because it's really what it is for you now. Just uh, abandon yourself to, to the street and to whatever comes to you, to accept the accident and all. And from this picture, we made a jump. You made a jump. Yeah. To <coughs> something else, because you normally, when when you talk about this picture in particular, yeah. you speak about the, uh, <coughs> the the richness of the medium and how a small 35 millimeters can contain so much. Uh, you often talk yeah. about the light bulbs in the, in the side. Yeah. The that black that black rectangle in the center of the frame that has 10,000 light bulbs in it. You know, it's one of those signs from the, from the 70s, and in in the slide which is only one inch and five eighths or something like that, in that slide, all, all 10,000 bulbs are visible. I've blown it up really big, and you could see every one of them. And I thought, wow, this rendering is so amazing. And if I want description, then I'm going to have to try something bigger. Yeah. And I went, I went out and I bought an 8 by 10 inch view camera. As a street photographer, that's like putting chains around my ankles and asking to, to run a race. <laughs> it was so ridiculous. But I loved it. And it, it, it fulfilled something else in me. And then I, by that time, I was printing color in my own darkroom. And I made you know, 55,000 prints in the time I spent in the darkroom. Let's move along on this one. Too. These are the, two, the first two pictures in the book, in Cape Light, which came out in 1978. So interesting, interesting um, contrast. And I think one of the good things about the book that actually was seminal in the art of making photo books is the sequence, the way you play with the phrases, where you construct yeah. phrases by just opposing pictures. Like, for example, from this one here, you can see the pool, and then the pool, the next page becomes yeah. that glass table. Yeah. Again, here you've got the shades of or the shadows of the clouds on the, on the, <coughs> on the dust that become the the blanket on which <coughs> Justine is... Yes, it rolls in some way. I mean, sometimes, you know, it's easy when you're making um, sort of photographic connections, when, when you're laying something out, to, to find things that work right away. You, you see the similarity, but sometimes it's, a, it's an undertone. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a, a little thread rather than a, a, a fist. Mm -hmm. And that thread, if its tensile strength is good enough, it will link the pictures together, and you will, you will find a rhythm in the pictures. And that will um, hold on to the, the attention of the reader. They'll know that something is tying it together, and they're not always certain what it is, but they can feel a sense until they get the rhythm. Mm. And then they can dance through the book. Now, we usually use this picture. We we didn't do it in the book, but in the book you can turn it around. But now, 
this is what you would see in a view camera. I don't know how many of you know it, but when you look at the glass behind the view camera, it's upside down and flipped. So it, the world really becomes a, a graphic yes, sort of. It's of quite picture. abstract, actually. You have to, you know, the, the floor is the ceiling, right? The sky is the ground. And, and suddenly you have to make all of your decisions inside a dark cloth, in a hood, in the, in, on the screen, to look at the, at the forces that are at play in the picture, mm. the dynamics, the verticals, the horizontals, the, the quality of the colors. And you're looking at the full size of your print right there. So the engagement with it was, mm. I, I tell you, it was thrilling. Mm. Everything I did with the view camera was like, I was gaga over it. <laughs> <laughs> I, get a, I would just groan. <laughs> I was like, oh, oh. I, I can't imagine how lucky I was at that moment, you know? And, and accidents uh, make themselves appear mm. just by being out there. You have to mm. be out there mm. all the time. Otherwise, if it happens, you're not there, it doesn't happen. You let go of the small format for the, for the big one, but the mentality is still the same. I mean, you still welcome the accident. You're still, you're still, you're still a street photographer, only not in New York, yeah. in, in slower... I, th I think if I had started with a view camera, I never could have f photographed on the streets. Mm -hmm. But working on the streets was training for seeing and for a certain kind of confidence and, and decision making. You know, yes, it's mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. Working with the view camera allowed me to bring in the street sensibility mm -hmm. and to be decisive enough. Mm -hmm. And I only make one picture. I never make, uh, you know, a run of, of the same thing. Because I only wanted to be decisive. That's what 35 millimeter taught me. You only have one chance. When that happens, it happens, it's gone. And so I, I felt that the view camera was the same thing. Be, just get what you feel strongest about. If it doesn't feel strong, if it empties itself out, walk away. That's, that's the ba you know, my, my basic modus operandi. After Cape Light, you worked on commissions, and one of them was um, in St. Louis. You photographed the arch, and there's a collection of pictures that go around. Basically, you, you described St. Louis as it was, and, um, but keep by keeping the arch always in the middle, and the reference for you was Okusai. What does that say there? It says, wrap up shortly. Wrap up shortly. <laughs> Thank you. Gotta... <laughs> Thank you for that. Does that mean like, like this? <laughs> or like this. It means that we're getting a bit too long. Okay, so, so whiz through, because we want to take your questions. We could even stop it here and start asking the questions. And maybe stop here. Yeah, okay. Anywhere. What, <laughs> what do we have after this? Any, I don't know, I don't remember. Run through quick. Oh, click, 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 click. Uh, well, we have, we have something important to talk about here. So that's a long yeah. story, guys. Yeah, okay. So, oh. How can I go through this? Like, oh, I know it's hard. Quickly. It's really hard to go through it quickly, Lorenzo. But really, I think I can tell from the tension in the room that there are questions. Okay. And, and we want to be tested. Question. Don't we? So Don't have we? we? Uh, yeah, we okay. have. Have you ever taken a picture and had immediate regret that you were too close to a private moment or bailed out on pressing the shutter for that reason? No regrets. You know, it all happens and changes and so fast. It just it flow with the moment, basically. Mm. Okay. Where in the Bronx did you grow up, and what was like your what was your neighborhood like? I grew up uh, in the sort of East Bronx, slightly to the north, near Sound View, Castle Hill, and everything. And we lived on a block that was like a small Italian village. There were about 3,000 people on the block and in five-story tall apartment buildings. And it was mostly, mostly people who had escaped the war in Europe. So it was Italians, Jews, Irish, Poles, and pretty much that. And it was a polyglot place and street life was everything. We were out on the street all the time with games of kids of every, every age, you know. All of my friends who were 13, who were 15 of us, right? <laughs> there were kids that were 14, there were 15 of them too. <laughs> so there was plenty of street action. And my father was the mayor of the block. 
my brother Rick is here, our father was the mayor of the block, and um, somehow he, his way of being stimulated me to see street life. My father was always pointing out, watch this, watch what those two guys are going to do, and then something would happen. And it was his call that incidents might appear that was so spot on, so regularly, that I began to read the street from, from his point of view. Because he was always saying, look at that. And maybe he made me pay attention to the world around me in the most simple way. Oh. So I owe him a debt. How do you feel about the street photographers working today? And do you think the documentation on New York has been going in a good direction? I think there are great street photographers working today. Some of them are right in this room tonight. Uh, but I also think that there's a change in the emotional weather on the streets, in that um, the smartphone has really changed a lot of things. And people's awareness is very different. There was a lot of innocence, as I said before. People didn't think you were making photographs about them, so they were relaxed. And nowadays, in almost every picture, there's someone doing this or doing this or you know, doing that. And so the pictures are skewed. When I see a lot of street work today, and there are photo phones in the pictures, they yeah. feel to me like it changes the texture of the, of the photograph mm -hmm. or it changes the meaning of it. Even while it's recording what's happening in this moment, it's a fact, but it, it's, it's a digression in a way. What okay, else? Uh, I think we have, we have little time left, so I don't know if we can go through all of the questions. I'll ask two more, and I'm sorry. Well, but we, we should have some live questions. That or were these, these? I think these are live questions. Okay. They, they Anybody want to ask a question? Yes. Stand up and speak up. I'll repeat the question if you ask it. Yeah. So the gentleman is asking about the transition between black and white and, and color. Uh, yeah, yeah. Sure, so, sure the, the graphic potency of black and white is a very strong characteristic. And I recognize that. And there are a lot of photographs that I made that use, that lean on the graphic strength, the way the, way the, you know, the forms um, hold the frame. But, you know, if, as I said before, you're talking about content. Content is elastic, and the color adds more content. I mean, black and white stops. The content is there, but it's the bones of the content. Unless you want to elicit more kind of Absolutely. I mean, you know, black and white is a great medium. I, I love the work that I did in it. You know, we just scanned 75,000 negatives in the studio, this guy right here. And uh, so I'm having a chance to revisit a lot of black and white work, 10 years of black and white work. And I'm, I see things in there that are just hilarious. I'm thrilled to see them again, to be reintroduced to them. But, um, but color is you know, how I live. I live in the color world. No, no. Okay, I think we have time for just one more question and then we're gonna wrap up. Is there anybody that wants to ask a question from the room or maybe I'll read one from, oh, have we got a lady over there. What do you think we lost with digital photography as opposed to film? What do you think we lost? Yes. Uh, I think we've gained a lot. Uh, first of all, a billion people on the planet every day take pictures with the their digital cameras or their iPhones. So it's in, engaged billions of people to use uh, the language. You know, photography is a language. The image is a language. Um, it's also, uh, you know, it's taken me out of the noxious, 
toxic fumes of the dark room, so maybe it saved my life a little bit. It also makes printing beautiful and easy in a way that, you know, black and white was a lot harder, the controls that one has. So I think there are a lot of assets that, that uh, digital has given us. And, you know, photography has, from its initial moment in the 19th century, it has progressed by technological changes. Every 10 years, 15 years, you know, you, you move from one new way of making pictures, salt prints, you know, platinum prints, um, you know, roll film, hand cameras. I mean, it keeps on changing. And when I saw digital coming, I mean, my, I had a show of digitally printed work in 1993 at the Art Institute of Chicago. I got, and the man is in the room today, a guy who used to work at Ken Hansen, he came to me at the beginning of this tonight and said, I was the one who gave you the Fujix printer. I borrowed a Fujix printer and I printed out, I, did, I had a Kodak scanner, I made 18 megabyte scan, uh, scans and I printed them on the Fujix printer. And it was an amazing experience to be able to print like that. And I thought to myself, this is going to get better and better. And in 1999, someone, Olympus, gave me their first digital camera, 1.8 megabyte file. It's like an email. <laughs> it's in and the book. I worked with that camera, and I saw immediately, even though it was tiny, I saw, oh, oh it's going to get better and better. It's going to keep doubling, you know, every, every year or so. It's going to get bigger and stronger and sharper and finer and more spontaneous. And look, it has. These are brilliant instruments that we have now. So, so everyone, I'm sorry that the time is up and we need to, to, to stop I here. Ha I hate. <laughs> Let me see. Thank you, Lorenzo. Thank you. Thank you. Stand up. Let me say, uh, let me say thank you.